Your silence will not protect you. These are familiar words. One of the most famous quotes from Audre Lorde, the black lesbian mother warrior poet. Your silence will not protect you. These words are powerful, and they are popular. You can buy them written on mugs, sweatshirts, blankets, posters, even in this day and age, face masks. The context of these words, however, is less well known. This quote comes from an essay entitled The Transformation of Silence into Language and Action. This essay was actually first delivered right here in Chicago at the Modern Language Association's Lesbian and Literature Panel in 1977. Lord wrote this essay after learning about a tumor in her breast, a medical encounter which, in her words, led to an involuntary reorganization of her life. She writes about this three week period in which she waited to hear the results of the biopsy. And in this three week period, she confronted her mortality and she began to agonizingly review the details of her life. The tumor was ultimately found to be benign, but Lord was forever changed because she found in this accounting of her life that the thing she most regretted were her silences. Indulge me for a moment because I, I have to read her words here. Death might be coming quickly now without regard for whether I had ever spoken what needed to be said or had only betrayed myself into small silences while I planned someday to speak or waited for someone else's words. My silences had not protected me. Your silence will not protect you. What are the words you do not yet have? What do you need to say? I am a black woman warrior poet doing my work. Come to ask you, are you doing yours? It is the weekend of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. holiday, a holiday where we celebrate one who did his work, who did not keep silent. King knew that silence would not protect his people. He knew that silence would not bring justice. So he did the work of a prophet. For Zion's sake, I will not keep silent. And for Jerusalem's sake, I will not rest until her vindication shines out like the dawn and her salvation like a burning torch. Isaiah, it was an important scripture, an important book for Dr. King. He turned to it often in his own preaching and his own spiritual life, taking inspiration from the story of another who pursued God's justice in the world. It shouldn't surprise us that Reverend Dr. King often turned to this book. Isaiah as a whole is about God's liberating involvement in history. The words of Isaiah remind us of God's liberating work in the past, 
And they ask us to trust in God's liberating work in the present and in the future. Today's section of Isaiah that Alice read for us so wonderfully, it's known as Third Isaiah. And it was written after the Babylonian exile. Many of the Jewish people were exiled from their land and held in captivity in Babylon. And they have just finally returned home. So the prophet is speaking to people who have greatly suffered. Likely speaking to people who are weary, despairing, and hopeless. Maybe even people who want to give up, who feel God has abandoned them entirely. The prophet speaks God's words into this despair, into this abyss. For Zion's sake, I will not keep silent. God says, I have not forgotten about you. I will not keep silent about what has happened. And we, we are going to work together until your community is a light for all to see. Perhaps we too are feeling weary and hopeless. We're tired of this pandemic. I'm tired of this pandemic. We're tired of meeting on Zoom. We are burdened by the knowledge of climate change and wealth inequality and continued racism and discrimination. Maybe we even long for the way things used to be the time before exile. My friends, we're not the first people to feel this way, which is why God sends her prophets. Reverend Dr. King lived under and prophesied in such times. Audre Lorde lived under and prophesied in such times. Isaiah lived under and prophesied in such times. The words of the prophets come to reinvigorate us to re-energize us. They tell us that God will not stay silent about all that is happening, but neither can we. For Zion's sake, I will not keep silent and for Jerusalem's sake, I will not rest. Hyde Park Union Church, what are we called to speak up about? And for whose sake will we push forward? The idea of not keeping silent implies strongly that there is a threat to speaking up, to speaking truth, to speaking at all. You know, there was a tangible looming threat for people who would not keep silent in the 60s. Those of you who lived it, I'm sure you recall that those who refused to keep silent met untimely death. John F. Kennedy, killed on November, in November of 63 at the age of 46. Malcolm X, killed February of 65 at the age of 39. Dr. King, killed in April of 68 at the age of 39. Robert F. Kennedy, killed June of 68 at the age of 42. There was a looming threat that became more real with each death for those who would not keep silent, yet they spoke anyway. And I'm convinced that they spoke regardless of the threat because greater than the threat was the promise. After the prophet Isaiah says in verse one that he will not keep silent, implying that there will be a cost to pay, he pivots to a promise. What promise can be great enough to overcome the threat, even the threat of death? Hear the promise from the prophet Isaiah in verse two. The nations shall see your vindication and all the kings your glory and you shall be called by a new name that the mouth of the Lord will give. The promise is indeed great. 
For not only did the prophet promise the people of Judah that they will be vindicated, authenticated, shown to be right and righteous, the prophet promised that nations will see their vindication and all the kings will see their glory. In other words, God is going to make a visual aid of justice and freedom and ultimately the power of the living God to turn things around. God's gonna make a visual aid out of you. God's going to make a visual aid of justice out of your people. The prophet Isaiah speaking to weary, worn out, oppressed people speaks great words of hope, not just that they would be vindicated, but that as they would be made a visual aid of God, that the world will see their glory. Let me, let me put it to you differently. We all deserve to live, to flourish as God has created us. In its simplest term, the hope is that regardless of race, creed, color, class, sexuality, age, or any other demographic by which we categorize ourselves, if we've been enslaved, oppressed, suppressed, robbed, denied our rights as human, beings to simply live unhindered by human oppression. God not only desires to vindicate us and restore us, but God will do so. And will do so in such a manner that the nations will see it. That shift, that pivot, if you will, from oppressed to fully alive and flourishing will be observable. That it will be glorious and that it will be so awesome that God who changes names as a sign of new life will even change our name. This is the promise of the prophet Isaiah today. And Dr. King, while he referenced Isaiah as a preacher, sometimes just made parallel statements because he too was a prophet. Dr. King said it this way, I've been to the mountaintop. And I don't mind like anybody, I would like to live a long life. The day he says before he's assassinated, longevity has its place. But I'm not concerned about that now. I just want to do God's will. And God has allowed me to go up to the mountain and I've looked over and I've seen the promised land. And I may not get there with you, but I I want you to know tonight that we as a people will get to the promised land. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. King, knowing his life was in imminent danger, took his last opportunity to promise the weary, tired, downtrodden, oppressed Black people in his audience that they would attain God's full glory and freedom, even flourishing as human beings. This is the hope that keeps me going when I'm weary about gun violence. This is the hope that keeps me on the wall when I'm tired of racism smacking me right in the face. This is the hope, the belief, the promise that keeps me going and keeps so many of us going when it seems that we should not have any hope in humanity. I open my word and I see that King wasn't the only royalty to write the vision of a day when all people would be free, but that the Prince of Peace, Jesus is his name, read from Isaiah just one verse earlier. It was on a scroll at the time and he opened the scroll or unrolled the scroll and said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, recovery of sight, for those who are blind and to set the oppressed free to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. God through Isaiah, God through Jesus, God through Dr. King and others said that oppression will end and we all will be allowed and able to flourish. Do you believe that? I must believe it. And the best part about it is that I open my eyes and I see it. I see tremendous progress. 
As I read and study and learn more about the realities of slavery and of oppression, we have a long way to go, but we have made tremendous strides towards freedom in a relatively short amount of time. And we've made these strides because prophets spoke and because people worked and marched and voted and sacrificed blood, sweat, and tears. And the evidence is clear that we can indeed walk together and live together and work together and make progress together. And if we call ourselves Christians, if we call ourselves Christians, we've agreed to be a part of the movement of bringing this vision to reality for all of God's children. We've made great progress yet because people are still being fed a diet of hatred and bigotry and fear. There is so much more progress to be made towards the promise of the prophets. But there's still more to the promise. Verse three reads, you shall be a crown of beauty in the hand of the Lord and a royal diadem in the hand of your God. Isaiah promises a great reversal. The very ones, the very ones who were exiled, captive and despised will be the crown in God's hand. This message reverberates throughout scripture and in the work of Jesus Christ. Again, and again and again, God sees beauty in the places that empire ignores. God sees worth in the places that empire despises. Imagine with me, imagine with me this resplendent crown, this royal diadem, a shining circle in God's hands. It is not filled with kings and CEOs. It is not filled with billionaires and their space shuttles. It is not filled with people who made the Forbes list by refusing to pay their employees a living wage. No, it is filled with death row inmates and addicts. It is filled with homeless trans youth and indigenous tribes confined to reservations and sex workers. It is filled with poor people of every race. It is filled with over-policed black and brown children. It is filled with ordinary people who struggle every single day to love themselves and to love their neighbors. This truth might make you uncomfortable. Good. God's message is not always comfortable. And we should not be comfortable with the misalignment of God's vision and the empire's values. We should not be comfortable with a society that celebrates exploitation, rewards exploitation, and punishes poverty. Now, let me be clear. God loves all her children. As Pastor Veronica said, God wants all of us to flourish. God wants all of us to shine in that crown. But God's love, it is yoked with justice. A justice that will lower mountains and raise up valleys. Dr. King put it like this once in a sermon, reminding his listeners that God intervenes for justice. Dr. King said, God has injected a principle in this universe. God has said that all men must respect the dignity and worth of all human personality. And if you don't do that, I will take charge. It seems this morning I can hear God speaking. I can hear God speaking throughout the universe saying, be still and know that I am God. And if you don't stop, if you don't straighten up, 
If you don't stop exploiting people, I'm going to rise up and break the backbone of your power. And your power will be no more. I know that God intervenes because I know the stories. God broke the backbone of slavery in Egypt. God broke the backbone of the transatlantic slave trade. God broke the backbone of Jim Crow. God broke the backbones of power that would have kept all of us from worshiping together as one church and would have kept Pastor Veronica and myself from the pulpit. Even now, God is at work breaking down oppressive powers around the world. So our question becomes, how do we participate? We want to be part of it. How do we shine? How do we shine as people? How do we shine as a church? My friends, we shine when we see the world through this divine lens. When we take on divine eyes, we shine when we honor the worth in every human person and every living being on this planet. We shine when we live into our calling toward anti-racism and the celebration of all identities. And we shine so brightly that others notice a difference. The prophet Isaiah in the final verse of this sermon says in verse four, you shall no more be termed forsaken and your land shall no more be termed desolate. You shall be called my delight. My delight is in her and your land married. For the Lord delights in you and your land shall be married. You know, there is a saying, some of you may have heard it, that it's not what someone calls you, it's what you answer to. That's not a biblical saying. For the people of Israel, the writers of the sacred text believe that names are indeed important. Those who enslaved my ancestors understood the power of names and name changing was part of their strategy of disconnecting the African people from their heritage, their culture, a strategy of disconnecting us from ourselves. So this word that God promised involves the changing of names just makes my soul happy that God has the final say so and will change our names, signifying a new day and a new life, signifying a total divine reversal of our being. The people of Judah in exile were named forsaken. It characterized what those who knew their plight thought of them and maybe what they thought of themselves. Their land was termed desolate, bleak, depressing, deserted, but the prophet further expounds upon the promise by being clear that the full reversal will happen for the people, so full a reversal that it will require a name change. Indeed, God is saying, I am going to reverse the situations in life that caused people to refer to you, Judah, as forsaken. I'm going to reverse it so much that your name will now be my delight is in her. And the land, the reversal is going to be so profound that your land will no longer be called desolate. Like nothing good comes from this land but now it will be called married, married. That there will be a day that black people will no longer be viewed by anyone as forsaken and that mother Africa will no longer be viewed by anyone as desolate. A day when that which was forsaken and considered desolate will be called married signifies covenant partnership. Married signifies someone you can rely on truly has your back. Married signifies the promise that someone cares deeply for you. Married in the sacred text signifies that someone will be there until the end. 
And the people hearing this from the prophet felt forsaken. The people even likely felt the land was desolate, but the prophet spoke the promise right in the midst of their misery. And for those under the sound of my voice as I prepare to close who have felt forsaken or feel that your people have been forsaken, hear the promise of God. For those under the sound of my voice who have felt alone, for those under the sound of our voices who have felt forgotten, for whom this pandemic of COVID-19 or this very long pandemic of racism is tiring and just getting old. Hear the hope of the prophet that God promises to never leave us nor forsake us. Hear the hope of Dr. King that we will indeed make it to the promised land the place of the fullness of God's glory. Hear and see the hope that stands before you every Sunday and that's standing before you together this morning, Pastor Sarah and myself, two people who could not stand together as pastors just 54 years ago when Dr. King was assassinated, but who are standing here today or sitting here today with you preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, a gospel that is a voice for the voiceless, gives hope for the hopeless, a gospel that sets the captives free. We couldn't have done this 54 years ago, y'all, not, not only because we weren't here yet, but because this country would not have allowed it. But a gospel that sets the captives free the prophets who spoke, the people who marched, the people who worked and walked and vote. We are here today because of them and because of you. A gospel that has embedded within it resurrection power. Hear and see the hope that we represent and that you represent. For you know what, we see it. As your pastors, we see it, we talk about it, and we live more into this role as your co-pastors. We see it, and we're excited about what God is doing. We're excited about how God can use all of us, High Park Union Church, in this leg of the journey of justice as a visual aid for justice, a visual aid for peace, a visual aid for freedom, and for unity to continue to bring God's people closer to the promise of love and flourishing for all people. And I don't know about you, but the promise all by itself gives me tremendous joy. The promise all by itself and all the evidence that we're on our way gives me peace that surpasses all understanding. The promise and the visual aid that is even before you today, which is all of us, gives me hope for tomorrow. So in the midst of your pain, in the midst of your weariness, in the midst of your personal struggle, we pray that the hope of the prophets permeates your soul and gives you joy, peace, and strength to keep working towards the promise of freedom and flourishing for all of God's children. And with that, let the church say, amen. Mm -hmm.